Hello and uh, welcome to the MICES live stream. Um, we have um, Ellen Kernish up to give the next talk. Um, Ellen um, is the senior data engineer at ThoughtWorks um, and we'll be giving a talk on um, data quality. The title is Mind Your Data, Data Quality for the Rest of Us. Uh, let me just introduce Ellen. Thank you very much. Cool. So, um, whenever I talk about uh, data and data quality with the engineers, I sometimes feel a bit like the fish in this this kind of story, which you may be familiar with. So there's an older fish meeting a younger fish in the water, and the older fish is asking the younger fish, "What is water?" And the younger fish is very confused by this question. He's asking, "No, sorry." The older fish is asking the younger fish, "How is the water today?" And the younger fish is very confused by this this question. He's asking, like. What is water? And sometimes, especially when we, for us that work a lot of data, I sometimes have the same feeling that we are also so immersed in our data and our technology, our software, that we're not really always very precisely clear about what we're exactly we're dealing with. And I think for, especially when we talk about data quality, it's really useful to have a very precise understanding of what data is. That's why I would like to zoom out in the beginning of my talk a little bit and just clarify for a second what can, how can we understand data quality? And so if we look at data up in the dictionary, the interesting thing is there are two definitions of data. One is information, especially fact or numbers, collected to be examined and considered and used to help with making decisions. For example, the data shows that more than 80% of the agricultural workforce is Hispanic. On the other hand, there's also a technical definition. And that's information in an electronic form that can be stored and processed by a computer, for example, the student's task was to prepare all the posters and electronic data for the publicity campaign. And what I found really interesting when I looked this up was that these things are really two sides of the same coin. It's not one is more correct or one only applies in one circumstance. But whenever we talk about data, it's really both things that are relevant. And while we as engineers, we tend to look at data more in the sense of we, could, we store it and we process and that's all the whole, the whole team of this conflict is like storing and scaling and streaming. So it's all about this technical definition of data. But when we talk about data quality, it's really, I find it really useful to keep in mind this other more business oriented definition of data, which is data is about making decisions and it's helping us making des decisions. And it's really both at the same time. And so just like when about data, there's different ways to look at it. Also, if you look at data quality, there's different ways to look at it. So, and so really what data quality is and what high quality data means is depends on who you ask. For instance, if you ask the data consumers, they usually take a more usage oriented perspective. They will ask things like, does our data meet our consumers' expectations? Does our data satisfy the requirements of its usage? On the other hand, if we, if we look at it from the perspective of a business, of the business as a whole, then we usually might take a more value oriented perspective. And we might ask ourselves things like, how much value are we getting out of our data? How much are we willing to invest into our data? And finally, but certainly not last, there is an engineering perspective, which is probably the one perspective on data quality that we are most familiar with, which is oriented around standards. And there we might ask things like, to which degree does our data fulfill its specifications? And in particular, how accurate, complete, and timely is our data? And again, it's not an either or thing. And all of these perspectives on data have their, and data quality have their own validity. And it's really about from which perspective are we looking at it and how can we be empathetic if we, if we are working together on data quality challenges? How can we make use of all these different perspectives? And in, in the rest of my talk, I would like to introduce you to a kind of running example that I use. And it's even though this talk is based a lot on the experience I have as a data engineering consultant, the example I picked is completely unrelated to my client because it's unconfidential and I can easily talk about it and it's kind of simple and easy to illustrate things with it. And the example is about this pond. You, you might be wondering what's so interesting about this pond, nothing particularly interesting about it. It's just it's the pond in my mom's garden and it's a pretty old pond, it's about two or three decades old. My grandfather built it originally. 
And as you can see, it's full of algae. That's why my mom isn't really fond of this pond and she wants to get rid of it. But I'm personally, as you might have seen from the example with the fish in the beginning, I'm really fond of ponds and I really like this pond. And so I, I tried to convince my mom to keep it and she told me we can keep it if I've managed to get rid of the algae. So I cleaned up the pond and I, I took out some algae, but of course the algae keep growing back. And so the question is now, how can I stop the algae growth? And I'm not really big on, on pond knowledge. So I thought I could do an experiment to figure out why do these algae grow and what can, what can I do to stop the algae growth or at least reduce the algae growth. And so I thought what I could do is do some kind, turn this into some kind of data science or analytics challenge where we look at the different factors that contribute to algae growth, like the water chemistry and the weather conditions and correlated or related to the algae coverage to find figure out which factors are particularly contributing to the algae growth. And then I might look, monitor things like the pH level, the nitrate, phosphate, and the hardness of the water, and also the sun hours per day and the temperature each day and the rainfall. And then of course, what part of the pond is covered in algae. And of course, as with any data collection challenge, there will be challenge and data processing thing, there will be data quality issues that might come up. So the first thing, challenge is that I don't live next to the pond. So I would have to ask my mom for, to get me the data every day. And that might introduce a lot of issues into, the, into, the, this, whole, into this whole process. So for instance, we don't really have expensive equipment to measure the, the water quality. We have to rely on these kind of hobbyist data quality, um, water, water chemical kits. And they're not super reliable, so the measurements might be really noisy. Another thing is that the algae coverage is really difficult to estimate consistently. It's easy to get, say, one day estimate the same algae cover as 55% and the next day at 65%, which to us wouldn't be a big difference. But if you show this in, say, a logistic regression, it might become really sensitive to such inconsistently estimated numbers. And also, my mom might just forget to do the measurements some days, or maybe she's having a bad day and she doesn't want to leave the house or whatever happens, or maybe it's raining all day. There might be reasons why she doesn't want to collect the data. And also, as she, as she sends me the measurements every day via email, they might get mixed up. I might save them in the wrong file. I might con confuse them in my Excel spreadsheet. All sorts of things might happen that might get us to the wrong data. And finally, the data might even get lost some days, maybe it's stuck in the, the email it ends up in my spam folder, or maybe she forgets to take a measurement, or maybe I accidentally delete a number, all things, kinds of things might happen. And even more things, of course, might happen. And all of this would make the prediction that I'm trying to run or the correlations that I'm trying to compute really, really unreliable and might not help me much with my undertaking. And so that for that, I was asking myself, how can we evade that data quality? avoid data quality issues. And again, I would like to first take a bit into the look into the theory to clarify some, some, define some roles here. And so when we talk about data quality management in, in the literature, there's, you usually find three different kinds of roles, which is the data producers and the data consumers as the business roles. And they're kind of what, what the name implies. So the data producers are the people that create, collect, and maintain the data. So in the, the example, that might be my mom gathering the measurements in the spreadsheet. And the data consumers are the people that use the data in their work activities. So in our example, that might be me trying to understand the correlations. On the other hand, there's also a technical role, and those are called data custodians. And those people are uh, what we commonly also understand nowadays as data engineers, uh, they design, develop, and operate the data infrastructure. And that might be me building a Python script for the analysis based on the email spreadsheet. And the interesting thing is each of these roles can contribute to data quality. For example, as a data producer, it's important to enter the right data or the valid data, label data correctly, correct a errors in entries and labels. And, and sorry, enter the data on time. And as a 
data consumer, on the other hand, it's important that I check the plausibility of the data if there's nothing really weird in it, that I interpret the data carefully, and that I report data quality issues so that they can be fixed. And last but not least, as a custodian, the person that's kind of in between the producers and the consumers, um, we, we, can, we need to make sure that we've done, validate our data transformations, that we monitor data quality, that we report data quality issues, and that we deliver data on time. And of course, there are other things so we can contribute. These are just a few examples. And now I would like to dig a bit deeper because of the audience of this conference, because into the data custodian world, and I would like to dig deeper in how we can measure data quality. And so the first, the tool we usually use to measure data quality, there's a concept of the data quality dimension. And the data quality dimension is a set of data quality attributes that represents a single aspect or construct of data quality. Again, that's a definition that's commonly used in the literature on this topic. And the interesting thing about the data quality dimension is that it connects a lot of different concepts in data quality management. So for example, the, the data quality dimension is tied to a data quality perspective. You remember that we had the usage perspective, the value perspective, and the standards perspective. And for each of them, we can define different dimensions that help us understand these perspectives. So for instance, for the usage perspective, it might be relevance. For the value perspective, it might be value added. And for the standard perspective, it might be uniqueness. And then based on these dimensions, we can define specific metrics that let us measure the quality for each dimension. So we can get an, uh, an estimate about how good the data is in each of these dimensions. And then based on these findings, we can finally design a data quality improvement strategy that's specific to the dimension. And of course, now the interesting question in, in the tech conference is, of course, we don't want to measure all of this by hand. We could in theory, but it would be really, really tedious, especially if we have large data sets, it might be even really painful and really expensive. So the question is, what dimension can we measure automatically? And for me, it was a really interesting realization or finding that a lot of dimensions can really not be measured automatically. So in, if we want to measure them, we need some kind of human judgment involved. That might be things, common dimensions that are mentioned in as desirable are things like interpretability of data, appropriate volume, ease of understanding, ease of access, security, relevance, value added, believability, and so on and so forth. But there are a few things that we can measure and we can measure them at different levels. So we can, for instance, measure them at the data point level, things like accuracy, completeness of field values, and other things. Or on the data set level, things like completeness of the data set, uniqueness of data sets, and timeliness, and again, other things. But I found it really interesting that a lot of what is considered desirable in terms of data quality really cannot be measured technically. But there are a few things, nevertheless, that we can measure automatically. And so we, while we can get a full picture with our automated data quality reports, we can at least get some kind of picture from our data quality reports. And so as the last kind of theoretical input that I'll give today, there's the two strategies for data quality validation. It's really, there's a lot of different, lot of different ways and a lot of different tooling out there to measure data quality. But really, they all boil down to two different strategies I found. One is rule-based, which work well whenever we can define absolute references for data quality. So, so for example, if we, had, if we look at my metric of other coverage, we can say the other coverage must never be empty because as soon as it's empty, we cannot use the whole day, daily data point because we can correlate our other fields with the, what, what we want to predict or correlate. And another thing that's very uh, kind of obvious fixed rule is sun hours must be between zero and 24. Even 24 sun hours is pretty unlikely, but definitely 25 sun hours per day is definitely an error. So we use rule-based validation strategies for conditions that must be met in any case for the data to be valid. And there's other things we can also define on the data set level. For example, there must be exactly seven entries per week and all dates must be unique. These are all rules we can define and if they're broken, there's definitely something wrong. Now, interestingly, there's also a more fuzzy way to measure, define data quality or validate data, 
And that's with anonymity detection, which is a conflict that, or at least used to be, I'm not sure if it's still as widely talked about, but for a while it was a really hype topic. And the, but it really what it boils down to is whenever it, it's data, anonymity based detection works well whenever we can define data relative, relative to other data points. So that's often used when we have spikes or drops in time series data. So then we, the relative means we look at relative to the past the his, through the historic data. And another way to say that, according to Wikipedia, anonymity detection is the event, identification of rare items, events, or observations which raise suspicions. So again, that points to the fact, the interesting thing is here, with the fixed rules, we definitely, if they're violated, we definitely know something is wrong. Whereas with anonymity detection, we just know there is something off but it's not necessarily wrong. It might actually be a valid measure, just something might have drastically changed in the data env collecting environment that made, the, that made the data change. For example, if we'll re you remember the pH value of the water quality, that we could say the pH value should not change dramatically, say not more than 50% for each day. It could change more, for instance, if we pour a bunch of acid or some other chemical into the water, or if it just rains a lot and the whole water gets flooded out, then the pH value might change dramatically and it would be a perfectly val valid measure to say that it has changed more than 50%. But unless something really dramatic happened to the pond, probably if it changes more than 50%, it might be off. And similarly, the number of measures should only be increasing over time if we want to have an example on the data set level. And now I would like to share some experiences with you to make it a bit more practical about how that I had with monitoring or my team had with monitoring data quality and data pipelines. I'll stick to the example, but the, the evaluation and the tooling experiences are really based on a client project I had. I just anonymized it to, to conform with the, with the pond example. And so let's imagine right now, my mom sends me an email with the data and then I have run a small Python script and it put, outputs some graphs and some, some nice correlation or regression coefficients or whatever I want to do. And that tells me the water quality. But the thing is, this thing needs to run a lot of times because you can't, based on just a few data points, you can't really analyze correlations that well. So we need to run this, say, over three months or something, some, really, some longer period. And that means a lot of data and it's getting really tedious. And TZUS also means error prone, and that's all things we can avoid by just automating things. And so let's imagine I build a kind of small data pipeline with a, and I build this kind of CDCI pipeline to deploy my code automatically and all the things we like to do in software engineering. And then what we can introduce is the idea of a data quality gate. So data qual quality gates are an idea that comes from continuous improvement, continuous deployment. And it's something that can be used to increase the confidence towards the deployed service. And more precisely, a quality gate is an automated checkpoint which the deployed artifact needs to pass to go live. For code, these are things we know very well. So this might be diff codes at different levels, so integration tests, unit tests, acceptance tests, uh, service level tests, usability tests, all sorts of level of tests that it think something has to pass. But it might also be things like static code analysis. So different kind of things that our code has to pass in order to, to be considered production ready. And for data, we can define something very similar actually, which is we can use those different validation strategies and define based on those our automatic checks and anonymously based detect validation to figure out, is this data set ready to go put into production or is there something that we should check or fix? And so to, I could extend my little pipeline by not only having a script that reads the, the, the um, spreadsheets from an email account, but also have my, add my validation checks and anonymity detection steps, and only then use the data to c compute my analysis. And then I was wondering what tool should I use? And I came up with this kind of little checklist, which tells me, um, what are the requirements for data quality monitoring tools? 
And there are a few things I came up with, and I think I have to speed up a little bit. Things like it can compute the needed metrics, can perform static checks, can alert on validation failures, can visualize the current and historic state of the metrics, for, and can integrate into our existing tool chain. And there were a few, there's actually quite a few data quality companies coming up right now. But some examples I looked at include um, Spark for Scala based DQ, which is the one I'll talk about later in the rest of my talk. And there's also a Python based framework called Great Expectations from Superconductive. And DQ, which we used in our project, is, as I mentioned, it's, it's produced by AWS Labs. And it's a Scala library for data quality validation on large data sets using Spark. So uh, you wouldn't actually use it on a small use case like my Pond example. But usually when we, when we, we don't usually build data pipelines for such small examples. So when we have a reasonably large data set, it makes sense to you. Well, it actually makes sense to deploy Spark. It also could be a good idea to use something like the queue. And the nice thing about the queue is it provides both rule-based validations and anonymity-based data validation. So it provides a lot of features that we can use. And it's also fairly easy to use, actually, which was, ple was, a, was a pleasant experience. So for instance, if we want to do a rule-based validation, all we have to do is the whole example fits onto one slide. So first, we instantiate the verification suite, which is the kind of wrapper that we use to, to call, start a validation. Then we define the data set. We add a check with the daisy chain. That, and for instance, here we define three checks. One that the data set has seven rows, so one for each day. Um, that the algae coverage field should never be empty and that the data is unique, which you might remember were all things we defined earlier as examples. Then we run the whole thing, and then we just check the status of the verification result. And if it's not a success, we can do something. Here we're just printing out that we found an error, but we could also throw an exception, or we could notify our logging system, or whatever we want to do with it. And very similarly, an anonymously based validation uses a similar schema. It's not much longer. It's a little bit more complicated, but not that much. Again, we start our verification suit. Then we define, uh, call our on data method to define on the data set we want to use. And then we do something slightly different, which is we use a repository. And the idea of a repository is that we need some place to keep track of the historic data. And that's what we do in this repository. It's, it's, usually a kind of JSON file where you just append the data. It could be residing, say, on S3 or someplace. And then you, with the next call, you append, save, or append the results of the, the validation that you just run. So your met computed metrics. And then, then you do the actual anomaly detection. And the Q here uses a very simple strategy. It just compares the, the last day data point with the current data point and says and looks at what the decrease is. And as you might remember, we wanted to make sure that our data set size never decreases. So we just define it should never decrease. And we run this on the size of the data set. And finally, again, we check whether our status was successful or not. And if it wasn't successful, we just say, OK, there was an anomaly detected. Or we do something, whatever else we want to do with the status. So that's, so that is pretty cool, actually, we found. And it's very easy to add this to any kind of Spark-based data pipeline. And also, the other really cool thing about the queue is there's a lot of these different kind of metrics that you can use. And they can operate both on columns of the data set and on the entire data set. And they can, they can be fairly consistently used for both rule and anomaly-based validation. And they provide a lot of example metrics. So for on data point level dimensions, on data set level dimensions. And that is also pretty, that, that means you can in theory run some very powerful data validation if you want to. But of course, like everything, everything has drawbacks as well. And so what we found is that the queue is a really promising framework, but it has some quirks still where it might not be completely ready for production, or at least for complex use cases. So on the positive side, the queue is really fast. 
because it's it's directly implemented in Spark and it computes its rules, checks, and both and all, even the anonymous detection really fast. As you can have seen, the validation can be implemented with very little code. There are lots of metrics to choose from, as you've also seen. And the library code is fairly easy to understand for digging deeper than the examples. And it's under it's under very active development, which is also nice. So even some of the things I'm saying right now might be already outdated because we we did our project a couple of months ago and the, the library has already changed. But the limitations are that right still at this very point, the documentation is very limited. So there's very few documentation of concepts. And most of the usage is just basic examples. So if you if you want to use all the power that the queue seems to provide, you really need to dig into the code to understand what it's doing and figure it out by yourself what it's doing. And there were also a few bugs, or at least one bug where we found that we had a false positive due to a sampling issue. And now I would like to wrap up my talk. So as you rem might remember from the beginning, data has two sides, inform inf information for decision-making and information in electronic forms. And both of these really are two sides of the same coin. And when we talk about data quality management, both of these definitions are useful and relevant. And likewise, data quality also has different, three different perspectives that we can take on it. And it, we can look at it from a user's perspective, from a business value perspective, and from an engineering standard perspective. And all of us contribute to high data quality, whether we're data consumers, data producers, or data processors. And as engineers, our main role is to automate the validation and monitoring. That was my talk. And now I'm happy to answer questions if there were any. Hi there, Ellen. Uh, thanks for that. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I'm a conference organizer and not a data scientist, but I still got quite a lot out of that. Um, we have some time for some questions now. So um, if you want to ask a question, you um, can ask it in the Slack. Um, we have one from um, Matthias. Um, Matthias asks, um, do you use any machine learning models to validate your uh, data quality? I personally do not. I'm sure. I, I mean, especially if you, we talk about complex anomaly detection, there are definitely machine learning models you could use. But I don't have experience with that, so I, I don't. I would also try whenever I can to keep the data validation me methods as simple as possible. And there's a lot of things you can do with these basic checks and basic strategies for anomaly detections, because you don't really want to add extra complexity in something where you already aren't totally sure whether it's an issue or not. And the simpler the strategy, the easier it is to figure out what happened and why the issue occurred. OK. Um, I can see that um, some people at are typing some questions in the, at the moment, so hopefully they will come through soon. Um, while we wait, I wonder if you can give us an update on the pond. How is the pond doing now? <laughs> the, the pond is still kind of full of algae, and I really need to clean it again. So we're still collecting data. <laughs> OK. <laughs> in process. Good. Um, So um, we have a more a comment from Lars. Lars Albertson says, finally, a talk that's fast enough to keep me awake. <laughs> I have the habit of watching recorded presentations at 1.75 speed. So, um, so do, uh, do we have any more questions? Write them down. Ah, we have someone writing a question. Uh, yep, we have a question from Alex. Alex says, um, are there methods uh, to assigning data quality at the point of use based on usage? I'm not sure I totally got the question. Could you repeat the question, perhaps? Yeah, are there methods of assessing data quality at the point of use or based on usage? I don't know, to be honest. Based, I mean, in the sense of what you 
what I could imagine yourself doing is you can definitely, if you have a, say, an, an, an application that uses data, you can track where the data is used and where people get confused. So say, if you have, if you have a dashboarding application, you can see where people get stuck. And that's something we've actually uh, tried out at the, at the client where I was work previously working. But I'm not sure if they're systematic methods. So it's, it's a very custom feel way of figuring and it's a very high level. It's a very abstract because you might find out, so for example, that at the point of usage, people always get stuck at the certain metrics that they look at, but then you still don't know why they're, they, they get stuck at this matter. So it's def there's definitely some indicators you can get, say, from tracking data, but it's it's further removed than if you say analyze the data somewhere in your pipeline or the generally the closer the, to your to production you you figure out the data quality issue, the easier it is also to fix and the easier it is to detect. Does that answer your question, or did I get in a totally different direction than what you were asking for? <laughs> We will see. Um, while we wait, uh, we have another question. Um, is there any relation between how you code test your pipelines and the data quality tests? Um, yes, there is actually. So, if you, when we, especially when we talk about data quality, uh, sorry, data transformations that we do in pipelines, say we aggregate some data, we combine some data sets, and all these kind of things. Those testing, those transformations definitely contributes to higher quality of data. So as soon as you, as you have any bugs in, in, in your basic data transformations, then of course those propagate into your data quality. So, so, data, so the testing, the pipeline, the code tests are definitely a part of ensuring data quality. Okay, and we have one more. Um, so from a higher level, who needs to take care of data quality in a company? Well, I would say anyone who's involved in the data. That's why I have this point you on my summary slide. Um, I mean, there's because there's different layers to this, uh, this question. So the first le level is, of course, everybody who's involved somewhere in either producing data or consuming data or then using the data, say, by making sure that the data is plausible and all these kind of things. Those that deal directly with the data, they're definitely all responsible for data quality. But my experience is that data quality initiatives, because they are kind of across different departments and they, they cannot just be located in, inside a data team or an IT department traditionally or wherever them, whoever might own the databases and maybe the applications. So there, there definitely needs to be, if, if the data is considered valuable enough to actually invest in data quality, there also needs to be some senior level commitment in, in, into the, the data quality management. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, uh, we can uh, continue this chat in the breakout room afterwards. I will um, post a link to that Jitsi room. So if anyone would like to continue the discussion, that's um, where it will take place. Um, yeah, check the Slack for that. And um, just wanted to say thank you again, Ellen, for a great talk. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me.